Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in this episode, I'm honored to have Dr. James Hoffman from Renaissance Periodization. And we discuss all things recovery and how we can differentiate various recovery modalities, what we need to focus on, as well as some of the fundamental methods that are supported by science and field experience and the strategies that we can use to manage fatigue to ensure that we're training hard and making gains. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. James Hoffman. Welcome guys to the JPS podcast and I'm honored today to have James Hoffman and I was very fortunate enough to, to meet James and to train with him and some of uh, the RP crew uh, when they were in Australia in Melbourne uh, last month. I had to think for a second there how long ago it was. It's been uh, a while, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, and yeah, I went to the RP conference uh, and James spoke about recovery, uh, which is something that I'm sure many of you uh, may have heard him talk about before. You might have read the recovery books. If not, uh, check them out. I'll link them in the description box below. But today we're going to talk about all things recovery. And I wanted to start and preface this conversation, uh, James, with just a brief introduction into what recovery and adaptation is. I know you uh, love Dr. Bill Sands uh, quote on this. So if you want to kick things off from that. Yeah, for sure. So this is something uh, that's really, really interesting topic because most people, uh, they have like an inherent value on this idea of recovery, right? Where they think, oh yeah, recovery is good. I should be doing things. But usually the way that people kind of go about looking into it is kind of backwards where they're usually like, oh, I need to start looking at all these crazy things I need to add into my program. And when you actually really look through the literature on what is recovery and how do we get the most out of our training, we find that there's just a lot of really basic, simple things. Uh, a lot of them are just kind of lifestyle related that you can do to really get the most out of all the stuff that you're already doing. And the reality is a lot of that fun, sexy stuff really just doesn't do much, if anything at all. So when we look into recovery, usually we're looking at the two components, right? The recovery portion and the adaptation component. So when you go and do hard sport training, whether it's trying to look good naked or be better for sport or whatever it is that you do, uh, every time you train or do sport, there is a timeline in which you can get back to normal, right? So you do a hard training session and then at some point, maybe a few days later, maybe even a week later for something hard like deadlifts, you should be able to train those muscles or movements again, right? And that's basically our recovery timeline. But most of us don't train to just be the same as we did the last time, right? We want to be better. So we have that adaptive component that we want to consider as well. So we want to make sure that we're not only getting back to normal, but actually exceeding normal, getting above baseline and being bigger, faster, stronger, sexier than we were before. So it's an interesting relationship. The, the two are obviously interrelated. Uh, we can't have adaptation without recovery, but we can have recovery without adaptation. So some of the strategies we look into might be uh, – might have those considerations at play. So it's a really fun, interesting topic. I think most people really enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. And uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, surrounding fatigue uh, and what that is. Uh, you know, people feel soreness in the gym. Uh, they might feel like they're not recovered uh, and they can't go back uh, and train again. Um, so I guess, do you want to cover, you know, or dispel some of the misunderstandings surrounding fatigue? Yeah, sure. So fatigue is this weird thing where most people under, like they, they kind of intuitively understand fatigue like, oh, I trained hard, now I feel tired, right? But what is fatigue actually doing? Well, there's a lot of things at play. So you go and do some training, whether it's really, really hard training or sport or whatever, and we're going to experience what we call acute fatigue, which is going to be diminished performance just as a result of whatever you just did right now, right? So if you go and do, uh, you work up to a, a max, one rep max on your bench press for that day, you can imagine like the rest of your chest work is probably not going to be great, right? It doesn't take a rocket science to, to tell you that. Why? Because you've experienced some acute fatigue from that high intensity effort that you made. Likewise, if you try and do uh, sprinting after squatting, your performance goes down. Everyone kind of already knows this, right? Well, what we also know is there's that acute component where my performance right now and maybe for the rest of the day is probably going to be inhibited a little bit. But we also have that cumulative or what we call uh, chronic fatigue, which is fatigue that's accumulating as a result of subsequent training uh, sessions or just lifestyle stressors in general. And that fatigue, unfortunately, doesn't just go away very quickly on its own. And what we find is that if you have a lot of stressors in your lifestyle and you train 
more than once uh, uh, more than once per week, which most people who are listening to this podcast do probably train four, five, six, maybe even seven times a week, or maybe more than eight sessions per week, depending on what they're doing, um, you are going to start accumulating a lot of fatigue uh, really quickly. And it's not just going to go away on its own. You have to take some steps to ameliorate it. What's really interesting and kind of uh, tying back to some other things like volume landmarks and yada, 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 uh, is that fatigue can has a tendency to mask some of the fitness that you already have so it'll inhibit your your ability to express certain fitness characteristics like strength power speed all that stuff as well as potentially can actually start inhibiting some of the recovery adaptive processes that you get from training in really bad scenarios so this has kind of led to this idea like oh if there's fatigue it's terrible we have to like make sure that you're not sorry <laughs> my cat's food just dropped i don't know if you heard that uh it's really loud uh he's actually uh he was getting really fatigued from his his luxurious first world lifestyle over here laying around. Now he's sprinting over to the bowl. Anyways, um, so now I got like totally off. I don't even remember what I was talking about. Cat's distracting me. Um, oh, we're talking about chronic fatigue. Yeah, and its effects. So we know that fatigue can mask your fitness and inhibit some of y y your ability to actually express that fitness, right? So that's kind of a big bummer. So people have adopted – really, really hyper conservative strategies, right? Where people are overly um, trying to avoid fatigue at all costs. Well, what's the problem there? Well, now you're actually not, you're, you're, you're training not to get hurt rather than training to get better at sport mm -hmm. or be sexy or whatever you want to do. Um, so then you're just, uh, it's a violation essentially of the overload principle, right? Where it's like, I'm actually being so conservative all the time, whether I'm trying to just not be fatigued. So I'm performing at my best all the time, or I'm trying not to get hurt or something like that. You're just never going to make any substantial progress. On the other hand, you have the fucking like Jim bro guys, the iron brotherhood, right? Where it's like, fatigue's nothing brother. You just got to get in there and fucking do it. Right. And there is something to be said about like being tough and gritty and all that, but that would also be overlooking a lot of obvious things like fatigue is a real thing. It's measurable. It's something that you can feel, perceive and actually like measure in a laboratory. So uh, we don't want to be on that side either where we just ignore the effects of fatigue. And that's where this principle of fatigue management comes in where we say we need to do hard training. We need to do overload training. We know that at the same time that we do that hard training, fatigue levels rise in order for us to keep doing hard training over time. We need to bring them back down periodically so that we can keep training. So that's really the goal. So it's, it's not one of these things where – you ignore fatigue um, or avoid fatigue, right? In order to manage fatigue, you have to generate it. There's no way around it. So our goal when we're talking about recovery strategies is training hard and getting the most out of your training, but also periodically bringing things like volume or some of your lifestyle factors at play into so that you can continue making progress over time. That's kind of the big take home, I think, for us. Yeah, awesome. And I guess if you just want to uh, elaborate further, you know, what are some of the ways that you know, you guys at RP measure fatigue because uh, we know that muscle soreness is one of them, um, but just getting sore from a training session doesn't necessarily mean that you're fatigued because we know that there are a number of systems uh, that get disrupted when we, you know, apply hard overloading training. So, you know, how do you yeah. guys measure that? There are dozens, dozens of different metrics that you can look at. Some of them are more worthwhile than others. So uh, and if you guys are interested, there's actually a free um, Juggernaut Training Systems article that Mike and I co-authored called Fatigue Indices and How to Use Them. You can check it out. Uh, but just a quick version of that, there's a bunch of things you can look at, only if a few of them really matter. The first and probably most telling one is performance, right? So how do you know if somebody is fatigued to the point of not being like in an appropriate state at the current at the current time because we know that you're supposed to be training hard at some point right what are some things you can look at well performance is the big one so if they are underperforming consistently right for not just one training session because they could just be having a shit day and that's hard to hard to judge two sessions three sessions four sessions you start to notice that they're way under like what their reps or their weight should be or their just kind of level of effort now you start to see a trend where it's like something is a little off here it's not just one or two bad days so performance whether it's in the gym on the pitch whatever it is that you want to look at right you could even look you can get really fancy if you want to look at like uh, gps metrics and footy right you can do something like that where you can say my athlete actually moved half as much during this practice or this match as they normally did, right? So that's a, kind of an indirect uh, indicator of how much work and performance they did. So performance, I think, is probably the most telling. There are other ones you can look at, and that can be like perception of fatigue, perception of um, 
like so you can look at like what you said like uh, tiredness soreness stiffness the problem is is that all of those things are actually not an indicator of being under recovered but actually an indicator that you did a sufficient job overloading so a lot of people say like i don't want to be super sore i'm trying to find things that make me less sore right that's not necessarily a good strategy because soreness stiffness swelling although not ideal all the time, uh, is an indicator that you did a good job with your training, right? So does that mean that if you're experiencing some of those things that you cannot go back and train again? No, absolutely not. In some cases, yes, but the majority of the time, no. You can go ahead and train even if you're sore. The, the bigger indicator will be like, did your performance really tank in that session? Soreness is just kind of a, 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 it can be an indirect measurement of protein synthesis, right? It's not a direct thing, but it's basically an indirect thing saying like, hey, there was some tissue damage. Now we're taking the time to actually start regenerating and doing some other stuff. Do you have to be 100% to go ahead and train again? No way. No way. All you need for the intents and purposes of recovery is to be able to do another overloading training session, right? And that means provide a bigger stimulus, whether that's a combination of volume and intensity, a bigger stimulus than you did last time, unless you're deloading, right? But a bigger stimulus than last time. That's the only requirement. So being a little sore, being a little stiff is okay. And it's expected. If you train more than, uh, you know, more than three days per week, you better believe there's going to be some carryover in fatigue and recovery from those last couple sessions that you did throughout the week, especially if you train like five or six days per week. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to fear like being stiff or sore and being like, oh, I don't know if I should train today. The bigger issue will be is like when you unrack the bar, can you go up and down like you normally do? Yes. Good to go, right? There are some other things that are noteworthy in there, though. Um, there's a couple psychological measures, particularly relating to stress, anxiety, and um, I'm trying to think of uh, oh, feelings of helplessness. So there's a couple markers on, on the psychological, the perceptive side that do seem to be pretty telling where if you are athlete, whether you're re recording it in a survey or you're just asking them, right? But basically one way or another, if they're reporting to you that they feel like their world is in just shambles, it's just chaos, that everything's collapsing around them, typically that is a very good indicator when it pops for uh, overreaching. That's usually one of the ones where if somebody is reporting like really, really heavy anxiety to you, they are probably, uh, especially if it's more than one reporting in a row, uh, in a row, if whether you did a survey or you just asked them and they're consistently saying like, dude, my world is just fucking falling apart right now. It's terrible. That's a pretty good indicator that something's up. A couple other ones, you can look at stuff like heart rate, uh, heart rate variability, resting heart rate. Um, unfortunately, those just um, don't tell you in a, a timeline that is particularly useful. Usually when those start to pop, when you start to get bad measurements on heart rate, you're, you're probably already too late. And what that means is that the person's already in like a, a, a fatigued state, borderline overreaching, maybe already full on overreaching. So you can't just tidy it up with a couple light sessions here or there. You probably are going to have to move into more drastic things like taking a deload or even like a lower volume mesocycle to ameliorate that. So those are a couple of the ones that we, we usually look at, usually like perception based ones. Performance is the big one. Uh, one that I like is just my coach's eye. And uh, Jacob, I know you've seen this, right? Where you'll have somebody come in, you're like, okay, today's like nothing crazy. We're going to squat or bench or whatever, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. And they unrack the bar and the first couple warmups are like, they're just shaking, like, and they're trying to walk it out. And you can just tell something's awry, right? And they're trying to do it anyway. And they look like shit. The technique's bad and they're shaking. And it's really slow. That's usually a good indicator too, right? Where you can just look at them and say like, mm, I don't know, something's going on here. I used to do that in, in, uh, when I was coaching uh, rugby. I would have a couple guys or girls and they would come in and, you know, you could just see it. You, they just look like shit. They're, they're missing passes, missing catches, stumbling. Their sprint technique's shitty. They can't jump. They can't do anything. And you're like, what is going on? And you can look into that and say, you know, uh, what's going on? And usually what they'll report to you is like, oh, I like – had a really hard training session that I tried to squeeze in before this. And you're like, okay, well, that, that one's obvious, right? Or like, oh, my boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with me or I bombed an exam or something. And you say, oh, okay, well, now clearly there's a bigger picture here. You're just a little stressed out, maybe physically and psychologically. It doesn't really matter because both of them accumulate in the same way. Maybe we need to take a light session or something. That's one that's more manageable, right? But uh, if – if you can, uh, if you see that, usually you can kind of work around it for one session, and if they bounce back the next time, 
usually not a big deal, right? But when you start to see that same shake, that same like lack of desire to train, that same just like, I don't know if this is going to happen more than once in a row, that consistency of measurement, that's when you know something's kind of up and funky. Yeah, awesome. That was uh, very thorough. And what I loved about your presentation and the recovery book was the pyramid uh, that you guys at RP have uh, devised that you know, ranks and outlines a hierarchy of, you know, the order of importance, uh, you know, in terms of where we should be focusing, uh, you know, our recovery strategies around. And the first point of call is to train within our maximal recoverable volume, a concept created by RP. So do you want to just outline why this is the foundation, not, you know, uh, immersion techniques or, you know, all the other things that are at the top of the pyramid? Sure. Yeah. So the volume landmarks is essentially our first choke point in our recovery talk. It's actually the first choke point in our performance talk as well. So it's kind of a big deal. And I think, you know, if you're listening on the outside going like, well, of course, it's a big deal. You guys made it up, right? Well, yeah, fair enough. But uh, essentially, the volume landmarks is a, a tool that we uh, it's just a, a nomenclature. It's just verbiage that is a way of describing the complex dose response relationships that we see with training. So uh, exercise scientists, sport physiologists for decades now have been looking at dose of training and expected response, whether that's growth or strength or both, right? And they have basically outlined like, yeah, there's not a magic number. At some point, there's um, no gains being made. You're simply just not doing enough training, right? Uh, and that tends to go up in kind of like a bell-shaped style curve where we see more and more and more and more and more gains as volume is added. But at some point, we also find that like at some volume or dose of training, like it kind of plateaus off. And then what we also see is kind of beyond that, like a very steep drop off. And then it can actually go below uh, the gain line where now we're actually losing. So we see this really, really cool relationship with training dose where we say there is some minimum amount of training that I need to do to get better. There's some maximum amount of training that I can tolerate and actually make a really, really large rate of gain. And then uh, there's also beyond that, which I'm actually making less progress, maybe not as good of gains, and even potentially making negative gains where I'm actually losing progress. So the volume landmarks is the tools that we use to kind of describe that. And there's four uh, that we outline in the book, which is the first one being the maintenance volume, which is probably the easiest one to understand. Basically ask the question, Sorry, I'm like Rick from Rick and Morty. I burp a lot, so I apologize ahead of time. Uh, basically, like how how much training do I need to do to not get worse, right? To not decondition, which the answer to that is surprisingly little, right? So the maintenance volume is basically our our bottom line, where it's like if I go below this. I'm going to start deconditioning at some point. So there's some minimum amount of training I need to do per week or per month so I don't get worse. The next one is what we call the minimum effective volume, which is the minimum amount of training you need to do in order to make progress. And that can be specific to strength or muscle growth or whatever, right? So there's some minimum amount of training you need to do, and that's substantially above your maintenance volume, right? So you have your maintenance volume, not getting worse. Minimum effective volume is a lot higher. There's a big gap in between those, right? So there's some minimum amount that you need to do to keep getting better. And unfortunately for us, that goes up as we get more and more trained. So uh, after that is uh, the next easiest one to understand is what we call the maximum recoverable volume, and that's the one that you mentioned in the book. And that is the top end, right, where this is the most training I can do from all the stuff that I'm doing. If I go beyond that, I'm going to be perpetually overreaching and actually making no gains or possibly negative gains, right? So this is the most I can basically recover from, period, end of story. And then the last one is what we call the maximum adaptive volume, which is essentially the space between the minimum that you need and the maximum that you can do. And there's this big kind of like golden training zone where if you're training within that at any given point in time, you're probably getting the best outcome that you can. So why is this relevant at all in our discussion on recovery? Well, it turns out if you are training below what we call your minimum effective volume, meaning you're not hitting the minimum threshold you need to make gains recoverability is just not a limiting factor for you. It's literally the only thing that's holding you back from being more jacked or stronger or whatever is training more, right? Not trying to recover more. You just need to train more at that point. What if you are training above your maximum recoverable volume? 
Well, there's nothing you can do to fix that. That's the problem. So if you really look at the magnitude of effect of training and overreaching, there's no hot, hot or cold bath. There's no like carbohydrate shake. There's no, you know, like f- listening to Enya in a, in your favorite relaxation chamber kind of thing. There's, there's nothing you can do to fix that. Unfortunately, it's just too powerful, the effect of training and the fatigue that you generate. So if you're over your maximum recoverable volume, nothing can fix that. So we have to be within what we call the volume landmarks or the minimum effective and the maximum recoverable to be making progress. That doesn't mean that we have to train everything at that, right? Some things can be at maintenance volume. Some things can be emphasized and de-emphasized, and that's fine. But if you're not there, the rest of the stuff, you just throw it in the bin because it doesn't matter. It's one of those things like, yeah, you can talk about like taking in, uh, you know, recovery drinks and doing massage and doing all this other stuff, but it's still not going to fix the problem. They're insufficiently powerful. So the volume landmarks was our big first choke point where we say if you're chronically under training, you're stuck. If you're chronically over training, you're stuck. you got to be in the middle. you got to be in that golden zone. And that's relative to your training age and what activities you're doing, et cetera. So that's the big one for us. We can't get around it. Awesome. And uh, moving from there, you had uh, passive uh, recovery modalities. So, you know, after somebody may have their, uh, you know, their training volume and their dose uh, in line and they're not uh, training too little or too much, uh, but they want to, you know, ensure that they can uh, maximize their recovery uh, so that they are able to continue overloading and do a little bit more uh, hard training to see further adaptations. What are some of those uh, strategies uh, and why are they second on the list? So the passive recovery strategies uh, are probably my favorite ones to talk about. And if you read the book, they're, they're, they're pretty much the focal point of the book, in my opinion. Um, the passive strategies are strategies, as the name kind of implies, pass, things that you do passively. You don't invest a lot of energy into it. You just kind of just kind of diffuse and do it. Uh, these are strategies that can include things like sleeping, napping, relaxing, stress management, and actually just having a few off days. And what we have found in our best estimation, so we said volume landmarks was the first choke point. The next choke point is the passive recovery modalities. And more specifically within that, the next choke point is sleep specifically. What we found is there's not, there's again, nothing you can do uh, to get around the effects of not sleeping. I always make the same lame joke where it's, you, you, there's no amount of heroin or, you know, uh, carbohydrates that you can take in in the long term to get around the effects of sleeping, right? You can kind of fudge it for a few days here or there, but it always catches up to you. There's no way around it. No one has ever conquered it. There's a very uh, minute group of people with a genetic condition where they can sleep for like four hours and be totally fine and be totally recovered. But the rest of us can't. Do you have that? Are you, are you serious? Yeah, dude. I sleep like four to five hours max a day. Yeah. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Is that by just by... Is that out of necessity or do you just, it's just how you wake up. You just wake up at four hours later. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. You are the, uh, the definitely the minority. Yeah. So the rest of us uh -uh, can't get away with that. And so we said, you know, sleep's the priority and hopefully that's a no brainer, but I know you've probably experienced this too. People will bitch about like being under recovered all the time. And then you're like, okay, how much are you sleeping? And they're like three hours a night. And you're like, get the fuck out of here, dude. What are you talking about being, you just don't like, it's one of those things um, when you're dealing with people who – and this is going to sound meaner than it's meant to sound, right? But people who are like, coach, I want to be like really great. I want to be a great athlete. I want to be really good looking. I want to – whatever their goal is, right? Just, I'm not trying to shit on their goals. But then they don't do basic stuff like they're dehydrated all the time. They don't sleep. Mm-hmm. And you're like, how serious are you if we have to have a discussion on hydration Cognitive and sleeping? dissonance. Yes, absolutely <laughs> cognitive dissonance. It's totally correct. And it's one of those where like it's really – it really like uh, – when those issues arise, it, it, you, you almost lose respect for those people in that regard because you're like, I thought you, you were serious, but I guess you're – this is where we're at, right? And again, I'm not trying to be mean about it, but it really does put it in perspective where it's like everyone knows about sleep and its, well, uh, its effect on your well-being and health. The same applies here, unfortunately. There's no way around sleep. It's one of the biggest autonomic regulators. It's one of the biggest stimulators of regeneration in the tissues. Like, they just can't get around it. So uh, there's a bunch of different strategies you can look at to try and improve sleep. But at the end of the day, should be shooting for somewhere between 6 and 10 hours. So we usually say around 8 hours per night on average for most people except for you being the weirdo. But – for most people, somewhere like you know, I usually recommend for uh, recreational people, like somewhere between six to eight, 
more advanced uh, or more competitive people between eight and 10. And that seems to be pretty consistent with what the literature says. So sleep, man, can't get around it. And so uh, within that same category, we also have these ideas of like relaxation and stress management, which are my favorite ones to talk about, because the more I dug into this, when I was uh, kind of starting this exploratory journey a few years ago, this idea of relaxation just kept coming up. And it was something that maybe wasn't verbally like explicit where people weren't, it wasn't like relaxation does this or that. But when you're looking at something and you're like, what is this method actually doing? Almost all the time, more often than not, whatever these fun, sexy methods are, they are usually an avenue or a catalyst into promoting this idea of relaxation, which is essentially getting yourself from your aroused physical or psychological state down to resting conditions, down to baseline conditions, right? And that seems to play, again, another major role in autonomic regulation, similar to what sleep does for the nighttime, relaxation helps us during the daytime in maintaining good conditions to promote anabolism, right? So if we can uh, reduce the amount of physical and psychological stress at any given point in time throughout the day, we are giving ourselves a better opportunity to promote anabolism because unfortunately, like being in a stress state and being in a recovered state, they just don't work at the same time very well. They do uh, they do operate at the same time, but they're usually like they're very much in flux. They don't tend to be like middle ground like this. It's like one's up, one's down, one's up, one's down. So if you are chronically like carrying around a lot of like physical or psychological stress, whatever it's from, you are inherently in suboptimal recovery conditions, whether it's autonomic, endocrine, you name it. So what we have found is that, yeah, throughout the day, it's probably a really good idea to try and maintain that resting psychological and physical state as much as you can right now. If you have a job, you have family, you have other stuff, it's impossible. You're going to have up and downs throughout the day. But what is reasonable is that if you want to be the best athlete that you can be, regardless of what your goal is, you want to try and maximize that as much as you can. In an ideal world, you would go train your balls off and then do nothing the rest of the day. Eat food, relax, hang out with your friends, family, and just chill out and have a great time. That would be pretty ideal. Most of us can't do that. Um, so relaxation is a big one, and it's a struggle. Once you kind of learn about it, then you're like, okay, well, how do I actually do that? Because I have shit I need to do throughout the day. I can't just like peace out and not like work or not like take care of my family or whatever it is going you got going on. And it's a struggle. So Part of the book is kind of like trying to find or at least uh, suggesting different avenues of trying to promote relaxation where you might say like, OK, I don't really think of it this way, but maybe like actually playing PlayStation for an hour is a way that I can bring myself down a little bit, especially if I've been working hard for the last five or six hours, watching a movie with my friends, having a meal, um, anything like that. You know, there's tons of different ways to go about it, but relaxation is definitely a big one. And then, uh, you want me to keep going? I feel like I'm rambling like a crazy person. No, man, it's awesome. It's awesome. You do your thing. Keep going. Keep going. (laughs) Feel free to jump in because otherwise I'm just going to like go (laughs) off in space. So we have this idea of relaxation, right, which is uh, bringing ourselves down into kind of resting conditions more or less. And then similar to that, we have stress management, which most people have learned that it's probably a good idea to do stress management for your health and for your well-being and longevity. Turns out also a pretty good idea for uh, training and recovery. Why is that? Well, Stress management acknowledges that shit is going to happen throughout the day, right? So we said we want to spend as much time relaxed as we can. After that, we're going to encounter stressors at some point. It's inevitable, right? Shit's going to happen. People are going to die. You're going to see Bogans doing weird things. By the way, Shannon Green sent me like the most legendary Bogan video ever. This guy was like chugging a VB. I at, did like, say that. Point. Did you say? Oh, it was awesome. I was like this – Is my like when I think we spend a lot of time in Queensland. So like that's when I think of Australia, that's what I usually think of. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, You're going to see weird shit like that all the time. Right. And uh, your boss might shit on your project that you've been working on, whatever. All sorts of crazy stuff comes up during life. And that's normal. Stress management basically says you cannot control your initial emotional response. It's mostly chemical. Mo- m- unless you're incredibly, incredibly well-trained, when you encounter a stressor, you're going to get an emotional response. That's normal. That's biology. You can't fix that. What you can control is your subsequent behavior, right? Where if you want to engage in behaviors that linger on to those nasty emotions like anxiety, stress, anger, all of the above, you are not doing yourself any favors, 
all that is going to do is prevent you from being in that anabolic state. You're going to be in that chronic stress elevated state. You're going to have elevated cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all that stuff, which is going to directly inhibit your ability to recover from hard training, period. So we have to find ways of practicing, controlling our behavior after we encounter stress source. That is stress management. So we say we acknowledge shit's going to happen. I can choose to really let it bother me and just brood on something and just uh, hold it and let it just fill me with tension for the rest of the day and all day I'm walking around like this, my neck's all fucked up, right? Or I can take some time, let it pass, and then try and flush it and move on with my day and still be productive, right? At some point, it becomes a choice. You can hold on to the shit and just be pissed off or be anxious the rest of the day, or you can find strategies to work around those things, try and get back into that relaxed state as best you can. And it takes practice. It's easier said than done, right? Like uh, we, my air conditioner just crapped out on us and it's we had like a heat wave in Southern California. It's been like, a, I don't know what it is in Celsius, but in, in Fahrenheit, it was like 110, 120 degrees, which is pretty hot, um, even for California. I think that's so, close to like 40 degrees. Yeah, I think so. So it was, it was pretty hot and our air conditioner was like uh, leaking through the ceiling and like it was pretty bad. So Mel and I were having a kind of shit couple of days. But at the end of the day, it's one of those like, am I going to sit here and be pissed off about the air conditioner? Yeah, it's uncomfortable and it's going to get fixed in a couple of days. And for these couple of days, I got to suck it up and I just got to deal with it. Right. If I'm going to sit here and be like, man, the fucking air conditioner is broken. Blah, 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 just That's going to stress her out. It's going to stress me out. And it doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose outside of just making me more upset. So it's one of those, like, it's easier said than done. It's easy to be upset. It takes some practice to bring it down a notch and realize that this is not productive. You need to move on. You know what I mean? Yeah, awesome. And uh, stemming from that, uh, one of the biggest takeaways I got from your presentation uh, was the influence of social support uh, and compassionate touch in helping <laughs> us. A, always yeah. the compassionate touch. Yeah, yeah. I think anyone who attended that presentation <laughs> would have uh, definitely had that one uh, lingering in their mind. Um, but but you uh, touched on why uh, these are really important uh, recovery modalities and why they can be useful. Uh, so do you want to elaborate on, you know, how that impacts recovery and is potentially something that people are not paying enough attention to? Yeah. So when we look at things like social support, compassionate touch, things like that, it's up there on the pyramid. It's not a big category, right? But it is something that's noteworthy. And it was a kind of a hard one to really flesh out because the underlying components in, in my research on this topic, it was there and I could see it, but it was never explicitly stated, right, in, in the context of exercise and sport. But you read about social support, you read about like psychological well-being and the evidence for promoting a healthy mental state, uh, confidence, efficacy in what you're doing is there. Have they did have they done a lot of direct research relating to sport or, you know, training and uh, sorry, this factor, not really, but they've done a lot of kind of uh, indirect research and in showing like it does have a very profound effect on psychological well-being. So what we suggest, you know, in, in our in the recovery book is like, yeah, at some point. You're going to do a good job with your training. You're going to do a good job with your relaxation stuff. You're going to do a good job with your nutrition and your active recovery methods. And at some point, like you're still going to struggle and that's okay. And that is when you're relying on the people that care about you the most seems to be a pretty good idea. And what we find is that, yes, having people that give a shit about you in this world does seem to be really good for your mental state. And that can translate into improved uh, confidence and efficacy in the things that you do, which is really neat, right? This can include, you know, people that you trust, your coworkers, your loved ones, your friends and family, even having like a coach, someone you can reach out to, or even going a little further and maybe reaching out to a therapist when things are getting really bad. And just knowing that there's somebody there that you can go to who can uh, at, at least provide you with some level of empathy, right? And that seems to be one of the big underlying factors. Like having empathy seems to promote well-being, knowing that somebody trust or has enough rapport with you to give you empathy is like very powerful. And it sounds kind of silly and foo-foo. And admittedly, as a sport physiologist, I do think it's a little bit on the foo-foo side, but I can't deny it either. It's there. It's something that we thought was definitely worth mentioning. Um, 
on a similar note, there's this idea of compassionate touch, right? Which is like one that everyone always goes bananas for. So this idea of compassionate touch is very similar to what we just discussed, where we said it's powerful to have a rapport with someone to the point of empathy, right? Well, what kind of rapport do you need to have with somebody to let them put their hands on you in a nice way, right? It can be sexual or non-sexual, but uh, it takes a little bit of you know, trust and uh, with that other person, even if you go get like a massage, right, you're assuming that that person is not going to molest you and, you know, rape you or something weird, right? You have an inherent amount of trust in that person as a professional or whatever, you have some rapport with them. Same thing goes with your friends and family. Like if you, uh, if you're with your girlfriend or boyfriend, fiance, whatever, um, and you, you know, if you come home, you're having a bad day and they give you a nice shoulder rub or, you know, a scratch on the head or something that feels good. It's awesome. It's a nice way of kind of promoting that relaxed state. If we look at uh, kind of a step further, we say, like, what about getting a massage? And this is where things, to me, get a little bit more interesting. Uh, you really comb through stuff on touch and massage. And if you look at touch specifically, touch seems to be positive. Touch seems to kind of provide uh, an enhanced, relaxed state. But most of the effects seem to be perceptive or psychological, right? But in some studies, they've actually looked at the effect of compassionate touch where they just, somebody engages in consensual, nice touching, and they can see like decreases in resting vital signs, uh, which essentially is again, promoting that relaxed state. If you look at massage, massage is kind of a weird one where for years, decades, decades, we just, uh, people made these outlandish claims about massage and recovery and it went unchecked forever. Everyone just assumed it was true. And in the last 20 years or so, exercise physiologists were kind of like, I don't know about all these ridiculous massage claims. And they've done a lot of research on it. And they have found that most of it was bogus. It was bunk. Um, so what they have found with massage is that they have looked at indicators of fatigue. They have looked at indicators of performance or structural damage to the muscle. And what they found is that uh, getting a massage for the purposes of recovering from training does not seem to have any physical effects outside of, again, promoting relaxation, again, being a confounder, right? But they don't seem to actually provide any tangible performance uh, uh, performance recovering or uh, physiology recovering effects. What they do provide is a substantial psychological effect. And most of us can relate to that, right? Because uh, if I was to tell you like, hey, you're going to get a massage after we're done, you'd probably be like, oh man, that's sweet. That's going to feel really good. I'm going to you know, like just relax and it's going to feel make me feel good for the next couple, you know, maybe for the rest of the day. And that's true. And that's what most people tend to report is it makes you feel better. Are you physically actually getting better? No. Probably not outside of being an avenue for relaxation, which we said was important, right? But the actual, if you try to, uh, if you try to separate out the effect of relaxation, the effect of having a therapist in, a, in the massage, right? And you just try to look at the effect of the massage itself. It really doesn't seem to do anything outside of per making people perceive that they are feeling better. So does that make it bad? No, it doesn't make it bad at all. Right. All that means is it's a primarily perceptive based as a psychological recovery. And that is still noteworthy. That's still good. What we just don't want to do is perpetuate some of these myths that people say, like massage, we'll get a massage. It'll make you feel better. Well, yeah, it'll make you feel better, but you won't be recovered. Right. You're still going to be carrying around that same physical fatigue that you were carrying before. Right. And so the reason I even bring this up is because sometimes we can get what we call false positive as a type one error. Right. Where you feel better. You train real hard. You're all fucked up. You're overreached, right? And you go get a massage, you feel better. And now you think, oh man, I feel better. Tomorrow I'm going to go back in there and fucking smash it. Well, what happens when you go in tomorrow? You're not actually recovered. You just felt like you were. You go in and you get crushed, right? And you realize like, damn, I guess I really wasn't doing that well. Or worse, you get injured or something ridiculous. So those are the types of things that we just want like coaches and athletes to be cognizant of. You, you're more prone to having those types of errors when you're not dealing with a kind of holistic, I don't want to say holistic, but like a systemic recovery. We want to address the physical and the psychological. Addressing them individually is okay, but then we can be prone to some of those errors. So that's why we bring it up. But ultimately, yeah, having people in the world that care about you uh, to the point where of empathy or touch seems to be positive. In the grand scheme of things, it's probably a relatively small effect, right, where it's not going to fix a lot of broken things. Like if you don't deload or you don't eat enough calories, it's not going to fix that. 
it's more of like uh, you have an ice cream sundae and you're like, do I want sprinkles or whipped cream, right? More like that type of relationship. So pick pick and choose which one you want, but it's not going to make the sundae. You know what I mean? It's just more of an add-on to the sundae. Awesome. I really like that analogy. And as you're very well aware, people love quick fixes. They love shortcuts. Uh, so what are some of the, the common shortcuts or voodoos uh, that aren't supported by science that you know people – will employ as a means to improve recovery oh man that's a tough one because there's so much weird shit out there right now i can't even keep up with the weird shit so the, the one that comes to mind you know and you're gonna laugh but is cupping so cupping's one uh that is unclear if there actually has an effect of at all right so not even saying a negative effect or a positive effect we don't even know if it does anything for exercise related and sport related stuff People have suggested that um, there's a therapeutic use for it, and there may be that I just – I don't follow that that line of research. But for in our context in exercise and sport, uh, there doesn't really seem to be any place for it. And like when you see somebody with the cupping bruises and the burns, I can't help but think – this is not promoting recovery in any way. You're actually inflicting trauma onto this person, physical trauma that now has to heal, right? At the very least, is going to be a painful distraction. Uh, you know what? You know what gets me? Okay, so I'm just ran, I'm tangent here, but I was watching um, UFC the other day, and one of the fighters came out with cup marks all over their back, and I was like, how fucking bad is that going to hurt if you take an elbow or a kick? in the back on those cupping bruises. It's going to hurt more than normal, right? It doesn't feel particularly good to get punched or kicked in, at any point in time, I'm sure. But that's a huge distraction. For me, that would be like now I might actually be taking my fighter outside of their normal tactics and game strategy because they have a really sensitive spot on their body that they're trying to protect now. So to me, I just it has nothing to do with what we were talking about, but it just seems like a silly one. I just don't understand its use. My dad, I was talking to my dad on the phone the other day, and he was like, oh, I just got a cupped. You know, what do you think of that? And I was like, not much. Uh, and he was like, really? I was like, yeah, man, I don't know what you're doing. He was like, but the, they said I had toxins in my back. I'm like, well, guess what? Those toxins are still there. This is bullshit. They don't even know what they're talking about, right? Like, uh, so that's one I think is hopefully will be bunked later. The one uh, when you, you mentioned quick fixes, and this is, a, a, I think, more of a, more pertinent to the quick fix is the ice. People love to jump in that ice bath, right? And it, it, rightfully so. The ice bath, is it actually is a quick fix. That's kind of the, the, the funny part about it, where if you have somebody who is fucked up, and especially if they have a lot of pain and stiffness and stuff like that, you can actually dump them in the ice bath, and then they will get back to performing at their normal abilities relatively fast, faster than normal. Um, but unfortunately – especially during kind of like normal training, like kind of what we call preparatory training where you're doing like you're just normal stuff. It does tend to have like that blunting effect where it's just kind of shaves the little bit of the fitness off of each one of those training sessions that you would have gotten. So uh, it is a quick fix, but it comes at a cost, at a long-term cost. And so one of the problems that we see a lot is people over-relying on using like the ice or the water immersion or the uh, uh, cryotherapy stuff they do it all the time after like, you know, multiple times per week. That is not a good use of that strategy because you're going to be losing out in the long term. I like to call it a death by bee stings problem where you're just losing out a little bit every single time you do it. But 10 years from now, how much are those little bits going to add up? It's going to be a couple percentage points potentially of difference, which is huge. So uh, I like the ice. Ice is good. Ice is really good when you have athletes. Like if you have a guy who's playing AFL they had a match, you know, on uh, Thursday. They had a, like a you know, impromptu like city scrimmage match, and then they have another one on Saturday. You better believe you're going to put them in the ice so they can play well on Saturday again, right? That's totally fine. But for people who are doing like hypertrophy training, strength training, and jumping in that ice bath all the time, it's probably not a good idea. Those are the ones that really like come to mind. Is there any that you have seen that you're kind of curious yeah, about? Yeah, the old uh, the Theragun, the electrical oh, yeah, stimulation, yeah. yeah. The Theragun is really interesting. So one of the, the problems that we see with like massage is that uh, the amount of pressure that you can generate is insufficient to actually stimulate skeletal muscle blood flow. That's one of the reasons, suspected reasons why it doesn't actually have any major regenerative effects. The Theragun actually might be able to do that. I don't know. So this is one where I would give it a maybe, not sure. I think the Theragun probably doesn't play a huge role in recovering from training, though I think 
it can have like physical therapy, athletic training uh, applications. And I think it is one of those where um, it tends to make people feel better temporarily, even if it's not fixing anything. So this is one of those things where we see this in a lot of different instances. Uh, you can see it in self myofascial release. You can see it in a number or a couple of instances where a lot of times what they will do uh, when you generate a big pressure point like that is for lack of a better term, we kind of see like an overloading effect on the nervous system where it starts to downregulate certain things. And it might be like stretch responses, pain receptors, because it gets a big stimulus and it's like, ah, fuck, turn that off. Right. And so uh, like one of the reasons why we see something like foam rolling work uh, uh, for stretching is because it actually can help downregulate some of like the GTO muscle spindle responses. So you do the pressure point on the foam roll and now you can stretch out a little further than you normally could. Does that mean that you actually change the tissue? No, it just means that you change the nervous system and the perception of that pain. Right. So now you can just tolerate that a little bit better. You still are in the same exact physical state that you were in before your tendons, your muscles have not changed to any significant degree. They're just more tolerant to that movement. Now, I think the Theragun operates on a very similar level where you're going to be applying a really a, a ton of pressure on that area. Uh, it's going to have kind of a temporary down regulatory effect on some of the nerves in those areas. And I think it's probably going to make, uh, if you have like pain, like I actually, I was, th the reason I was even thinking about this the other day is because I did something to my neck a couple days ago. I have no fucking clue what did. I wasn't, it wasn't working out. It wasn't, I don't know what happened, but I've been having this horrible neck and scapula pain. And I think I just cranked my head or something when I was sleeping. I have no idea. And it's in a spot that I just can't get. And I was like, man, I wish I had like that stupid Theragun thing so I could just put some pressure on there to make me stop feeling pain for a little while. And I think that would be a big benefit there. We just don't want to confuse ourselves and say like the absence of pain does not mean the, the presence of recovery. You know what I mean? It just means that pain, it's like taking, a, taking some Tylenol. The pain will go away. You're still fucked up, right? I think it's more along those lines. Uh, I, do I know that to be true? No, that's just my suspicion. So I give that one a maybe. The e-stim is one that they do have some research on. And it, it uh, it's kind of interesting. So they've looked at e-stim and they said, all right, does this, this works for physiotherapy, right? So if people need to relearn how to contract their muscle, seems to be good. Is it good for um, pain therapy? People have a lot of pain. E-stim seems to be good. Cool. Does it help enhance recovery from hard training or from sport? Maybe. They're about It's like 50-50. If you read through the papers, there's like some papers that say there is an effect of, in, of promoting recovery of exercise performance. There's a bunch of papers that say it doesn't. And then there are there's a there's one that really like irks me a little bit because it, it, it tried to compare the effects of e-stim and active recovery, which it's just like a it's like it's not even like a tomato tomato thing. It's like it's a tomato. Chase. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's two just just two different things. It's just too dissimilar of a comparison. And we know active recovery works really, really well. And now they're trying to say like, oh, this is basically as good as active recovery. And it's like, eh, I don't know about that. So there's not a consensus on the e-stem. It's 50-50 uh, it's right now. Whatever effect that is there does not seem to be unique to the e-stem. It just seems to be an, as, an, uh, as it relates to blood flow to the muscle, which you can get through voluntary movement or through e-stem. I did read something that suggested that the actual – there doesn't seem to be a, a distinct effect of the e-stem only that it elicits muscle contraction, which stimulates blood flow, and that seems to be the big benefit. I would say it's a cool dick wagging toy that you can show off to your friends. Is it is it gonna is it a staple for me and and people I work with? No, I think it's probably gonna come and go. What awesome, do you think, man? Yeah, well, I'm not the expert, so I'll take what uh, you say and, and <laughs> use my own judgment to yeah stick to the basics yeah. and focus on the big rocks. They have like they have like ones that you can like interface with your phone now and like yeah, all this crazy all sorts stuff. Of whack, whack shit out there now, but no, James, yeah. man, you uh, blew that one out of the park. You definitely need a drink after that. Thank you so <laughs> much for your time today and coming on the show, guys. Make sure you check out James Hoffman uh, and all of uh, the work that he does at uh, Renaissance Periodization. Uh, and a link uh, in the description box below uh, the references for the articles uh, that James mentioned. James, pleasure having you on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a blast talking shop. <laughs> Thank you.